is the fourth time I've had the great honor of speaking to this assembly as President of the United States. It'll be my last. I've seen a remarkable sweep of history. I was first elected to office in the United States of America as a U.S. Senator in 1972. Now, I know I look like I'm only 40. I know that. <laughs> I was 29 years old. Back then, we were living through an inflection point, a moment of tension and uncertainty. The world was divided by the Cold War. The Middle East was headed toward war. America was at war in Vietnam, at that point, the longest war in America's history. Our country was divided and angry, and there were questions about our staying power and our future. But even then, I entered public life not out of despair, but out of optimism. The United States and the world got through that moment. It wasn't easy or simple without significant setbacks. But we go on to reduce the threat of nuclear weapons throughout the, uh, through arms control, and then go on to bring the Cold War itself to an end. Israel and Egypt went to war but then forged a historic peace. We ended the war in Vietnam. The last year in Hanoi, I was met with the Vietnamese leadership. We elevated our partnership to the highest level. It's a testament to the resilience of the human spirit and the capacity for reconciliation. That today, the United States and Vietnam are partners and friends. And it's proof that even from the horrors of war, there is a way forward. Things can get better. We should never forget that. I've seen that throughout my career. In the 1980s, I spoke out against apartheid in South Africa. And then I watched the racist regime fall. In the 1990s, I worked to hold Milosevic accountable for war crimes. He was held accountable. At home, I wrote and passed the Violence Against Women Act to end the scourge of violence against women and girls not only in America, but across the world, as many of you have as well. But we have so much more to do, especially against rape and sexual violence as weapons of war and terror. We were attacked on 9-11 by Al-Qaeda and Osama bin Laden. We brought him justice. Then I came to the presidency in another moment of crisis and uncertainty. I believed America had to look forward New challenges, new threats, new opportunities were in front of us. We needed to put ourselves in a position to see the threats, to deal with the challenges, and to seize the opportunities as well. We need to end the era of war that began on 9-11. As Vice President to President Obama, he asked me to work to wind down the military operations in Iraq, and we did, painful as it was. When I came to office as president, Afghanistan had replaced Vietnam as America's longest war. I was determined to end it, and I did. It was a hard decision, but the right decision. Four American presidents had faced that decision, but I was determined not to leave it to the fifth. It was a decision accompanied by tragedy. Thirteen brave Americans lost their lives, along with hundreds of Afghans in a suicide bomb. I think those lost lives, I think of them every day. I think of all the 2,461 U.S. military deaths over a long 20 years of that war. 20,744 American servicemen wounded in action. I think of their service, their sacrifice, and their heroism. I know other countries lost their own men and women fighting alongside us. We honor their sacrifices as well. To face the future, I was also determined to rebuild my country's alliance and the partnerships to a level not previously seen. We did. We did just that, from traditional treaty alliances to new partnerships like the Quad with the United States, Japan, Australia, and India. I know, I know many look at the world today and see difficulties and react with despair, but I do not. I won't. As leaders, we don't have the luxury 
I recognize the challenges from Ukraine to Gaza to Sudan and beyond. War, hunger, terrorism, brutality, record displacement of people, a climate crisis, democracy at risk, stranger than our societies, the promise of artificial intelligence and its significant risk. The list goes on. But maybe because all I've seen and all we have done together over the decades, I have hope. I know there is a, w a way forward. In 1919, the Irish poet William Butler Yeats described a world, and I quote, where things fall apart, the center cannot hold, mere anarchy is loosed upon the world, end of quote. Some may say those words describe the world not just in 1919, but in 2024. But I see a, crit a critical distinction. In our time, the center has held. Leaders and people from every region and across the political spectrum have stood together, turned the page. We turned the page in the worst pandemic in a century. We made sure COVID no longer controls our lives. We defended the UN Charter and ensured the survival of Ukraine as a free nation. My country made the largest investment in climate, clean energy ever anywhere in history. There will always be forces that pull our countries apart and the world apart. Aggression, extremism, chaos, and cynicism. A desire to retreat from the world and go it alone. Our task, our test, is to make sure that the forces holding us together are stronger than those who are pulling us apart. That the principles of partnership that we came here each year to uphold can withstand the challenges that the center holds once again. My fellow leaders, I truly believe we're at another inflection point in world history. But the choices we make today will determine our future for decades to come. Will we stand behind the principles that unite us? Will we stand firm against aggression? We, will we end the conflicts that are raging today? We take on global challenges like climate change, hunger, and disease. Will we plan now for the opportunities and risk of a revolutionary new technologies? I want to talk today about each of these decisions and the actions, in my view, we must take. To start, each of us in this body has made a commitment to the principles of the UN Charter to stand up against aggression. When Russia invaded Ukraine, we could have stood by and merely protested. But Vice President Harris and I understood that that was an assault on everything this institution was supposed to stand for. And so, in my direction, America stepped into the breach, providing massive security and economic and humanitarian assistance. Our NATO allies and partners in 50-plus nations stood up as well. But most importantly, the Ukrainian people stood up. I ask the people of this chamber to stand up for them. The good news is Putin's war has failed and his, at his core aim. He set out to destroy Ukraine, but Ukraine is still free. He set out to weaken NATO, but NATO is bigger, stronger, and more united than ever before with two new members, Finland and Sweden. But we cannot let up. The world now has another choice to make. Will we sustain our support to help Ukraine win this war and preserve its freedom, or walk away and let aggression be renewed and a nation be destroyed? I know my answer. We cannot grow weary. We cannot look away. And we will not let up on our support for Ukraine. Not until Ukraine wins a just and durable peace in the U.N. Charter. We also need to uphold our principles as we seek to responsibly manage the competition with China so it does not veer into conflict. We stand ready to cooperate on urgent challenges for the good of our people and the people everywhere. We recently resumed cooperation with China 
to stop the flow of deadly synthetic narcotics. I appreciate the collaboration. It matters for the people of my country, and many others around the world. On matters of conviction, the United States is unabashed pushing back against unfair economic competition, against military coercion of other nations and in the South China Sea, and maintaining peace and stability across the Taiwan Straits, and protecting our most advanced technologies so they cannot be used against us or any of our partners. At the same time, we're going to continue to strengthen our network of alliances and partnerships across the Indo-Pacific. These partnerships are not against any nation. They're building blocks for a free, open, secure, and peaceful Indo-Pacific. We're also working to bring greater measure of peace and stability to the Middle East. The world must not flinch from the horrors of October 7th. Any country, any country, would have the right and responsibility to ensure that such an attack can never happen again. Thousands of armed Hamas terrorists invaded a sovereign state, slaughtering and massacring more than 1,200 people, including 46 Americans, in their homes and at a music festival. Despicable acts of sexual violence, 250 innocents taken hostage. I've met with the families of those hostages. I've grieved with them. They're going through hell. Innocent civilians in Gaza are also going through hell. Thousands and thousands killed, including aid workers. Too many families dislocated, crowding in the tents, facing a dire humanitarian situation. They did not ask for this war that Hamas started. I put forward with Qatar and Egypt a ceasefire and hostage deal. It's been endorsed by the UN Security Council. Now is the time for the parties to finalize its terms, bring the hostages home, and secure security for Israel and Gaza free of Hamas grip, ease the suffering in Gaza, and end this war. On October 7th, <laughs> since October 7th, we've also been determined prevent a wider war that engulfs the entire region. Hezbollah, unprovoked, during the October 7th attack, launching rockets into Israel. Almost a year later, too many on each side of the Israeli-Lebanon border remain displaced. Full-scale war is not in anyone's interest. Even if the situation has escalated, a diplomatic solution is still possible. In fact, it remains the only path to lasting security, to allow the residents from both countries to return to their homes and the border safely. You're That's listening to President working. Joe That's Biden giving his last speech to the U.N. General Assembly. One of the things he was stressed is the to choices they're making today will have effect and have an impact on the outcomes for decades to come. CTV Scott Hurst is tracking the situation in Lebanon, and you heard the president talking about ways to end the conflict. We're going to bring you in now, Scott, and talk about the latest there. It is... Uh, Changing by the minute, very volatile. Yeah, Roger, and this is an important speech that we just heard from Joe Biden. As you mentioned, it is likely his last one in front of the U.N. General Assembly as commander-in-chief, as he is, of course, not seeking re-election in the U.S. And he touched on a lot of things there, uh, looking back and recollecting on some of his... Uh, uh, some of his wins, you could say, on the world stage as vice president and president, but also touching on the issues that are affecting world leaders right now, particularly, as you mentioned, what's going on in the Middle East and between Israel and Lebanon and Israel and Hamas in Gaza as well, saying they're still pushing for that ceasefire between Israel and Hamas in Gaza, but saying full-scale war is not in anyone's interest uh, as they're looking to find a solution to bring the region back from a full-scale war, bring the back from the brink, as we've been seeing, Roger, quite an escalation over the past couple of days uh, between Israel and Hezbollah in Lebanon. And uh, and with that with that escalation, are we hearing any more any any updates on the situation? Concerns about this becoming a full blown war, uh, more talk in New York about the situation. That is the concern right now, Roger, amongst world leaders there uh, uh, gathered at the U.N. General Assembly in New York, is that this could escalate into a much broader full-scale war. And we've seen over the last couple of days the, the, the uh, exchange of 
fire between Israel and Hezbollah. And this has become quite concerning for world leaders. And this is now the deadliest barrage between the two in nearly 20 years. And we've heard from the Israeli defense chief that they're planning for the next stage in this conflict. And we're also hearing from um, from uh, Melanie Jolie, who's also expected to uh, talk to the uh, world leaders at the UN General Assembly, and her message to Canadians in the region as well is get out while you still can, return home immediately, and do not travel to Lebanon because of the deteriorating security situation. But at this time, Canada in the Canadian government, they're not planning any evacuation routes for Canadians from the region. The message to Canadians in the region, Roger, right now is get out while you still can, get out while commercial options are still available. All right, CTV Scott Hurst, thank you for that update. Thanks, Roger.